Where are we now then? We're 1941. And are you still surveying? No, I think. <clears throat> Roger, stop then. No, I think they, they did, suddenly decided that um, the war had caused us some problems. Yeah. And the problems had started actually. Um, when did the war start? Uh, 1939. There you go. 1939, that's, that's right. I mean. um, electrical and mechanical on the coal face. Now, what had happened? You might I'm trying to get to the fridge here. Nigel, thank you. What had happened was. Uh, a few days before the war started, my dad had taken us on holiday to the Norbrecht Hotel in Scarborough. Oh, yeah. That's the first time we got enough money to go and stay in the hotel. Because everybody went there, was it? It was either Scarborough or Whitby, was it? That's right. Because you, you must have been posh, you were white collar, weren't you? That's right. Because yeah. the, the workers would have gone to Will, wouldn't they? That's right. no Blackpool. Oh, but no Blackpool then, <laughs> too far. Ah, yeah. And, uh, the war broke out on the Sunday, halfway through the week. Well, my dad had been in touch with A.J. Crofts, and A.J. Crofts had filled him in with some shocking news, so he sent uh, a car to fetch dad back, because the shocking news was that the government had called up all the territorial army, and of which 395 were workers at Chatley Whitfield. Right. Got you. Yep. So, so we lost those one night. Gone. So you're talking, you like you say, if you've got 3,000. Uh, 3, yeah, but they, 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 these are the young, fit, healthy men. You you're talking they, they third of a shift them. gone. That, that's right. Cover face men, men, most of them. Yeah. Yeah. So Dad went back, and the pit had produced, on average, about 31,000 tonnes of coal a week up until then, and overnight it dropped to 16,000. Because of the, the loss, right, loss right. of the manpower? That's right. And uh, it, it, everybody was sort of screaming mad about that that's bloody stupid they are. Do they want them in the army? Do they want them in the coal mines? And, you couldn't make the mines up until Bevin started. Ah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. A lot later. Um, so Dad was whizzed back, so we went down from 13 coal faces to about six, and we were chasing all over the place. And also, we must have lost a lot of technical bods as well. So my Dad promoted me to being an electrical mechanical coal face maintenance man. And had you any experience? That's a no, none whatsoever. No, none at that stage. <laughs> other uh, other <laughs> than I'd been tra trained. Uh, you were coming up through the ranks. That's right. Because you were only how old? I was seventeen. 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 Then. So they gave me a coal face to look after from an electrical and a mechanical point of view, and the unions never agreed to that sort of su surveying be legal. They wanted electricians to do it and mechanics to do it, but not the one to do the two. But the, fact, but the fact was there wasn't enough to do it. That's right, so I had to do it. And I learned quite a, l a lot of tricks in that, and a lot of differences between DC electrics and AC electrics in, yes. the, in the pit. But so what? Pra practical just, bits, so. just going for D DC and AC. We're not talking 240 volt AC, are we? Uh, no, you're talking. Down there. No, no, you're talking. Uh, the DC was four, four. 440. Right. And AC was about 1100. Right. So I take it DC was the older type of system. Correct. And the, what, the DC was the killer. 
Yes. Because if you if you touch wires from the DC, you're you, stuck. You didn't you didn't jolt you. That's right. That was it. Correct. That was it. Job done. That's right. Yeah. So and the other thing. The, the, the birth of the Bernie Lewis. Fun. We're getting not there. Yet. We're, we're not there. Yet. We're there. We're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. Now. The other thing about DC in that sense is that uh, it had advantages over AC in that it was a, 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 had got a good start-up force, DC, but it lost its power over, over transmission. If you went a long way underground with 440 volts... It just disappeared. Uh, you got down to 400 and not far down the line, so yes, yes, it, it, yeah. We we started to use electric motors DC, and then found that it they wouldn't perform as well. So we changed over to AC in the end to, to clear the decks. And were you saying that the D, the DC was being produced by the old powerhouse? That's right. Which is now yeah, the middle middle pit middle pit powerhouse. powerhouse. That's right. Yeah. And was never translated into the Plato Institute or Haskell. So whilst you were there, John, did he just sort of die out? or did No, we used it. So keep going. Yeah, we used it. In fact, it comes to the next stage. We used DC on coal cutters because it gave us a, a, a big impact start. But right, yeah, I'm with you. Like, oof. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But... They, they needed maintenance, and the maintenance was a bloody nuisance. They had to go and take the cover off the motor, and the, the, the rotor was built with copper strips and insulated strips, and was run with carbon fibre tops, and that filled in the gaps in between, so you had to go down the pit with a hacksaw and spend hours hacksawing that. Clean. It was a bloody tedious maintenance job. So in the end, we went to AC, which was straight, clean, and, and chopped on. Yeah, yeah chopped on. Yeah. And that sort of thing. But they were good motors. And <clears throat> during that time, I met a gentleman quite by accident in, in the circumstances that years later stood me in good stead on the nationalisation. Right. The, we, we found somebody selling, they were finishing with their DC and they were selling two motors off DC cheap and I went to get them and I was told not to pay more than 60 quid for them or something like that and the managing director of, of Manchester Collieries at that stage was a gentleman who be, became titled afterwards in the coal board, right. became deputy chairman, I'll think of his name in a minute. And years later, when I was interviewed for a job at the headquarters, and he was interviewing me, he looked at me and he said, I know you. You bought, you bought two bloody motors off me, cheaper than that <laughs> So really, this, despite, despite the fact that the coal industry was a massive, massive countrywide uh, employer, yes. it was quite close-knit. Oh, very close-knit. Let me tell you this, without hesitation, that there were some colliery companies, big colliery companies, who if you applied to them, and you came from other colliery companies, they wouldn't touch you. You come from Doncaster Amalgamated? Don't want to know you. Uh, right. And you come from Lancashire Mine? Don't want to know you. Come from South Wales? Put off, mate. Uh, if you come from Stoke-on-Trent, yes, we welcome you with open arms or so. So, Quite a lot. so there wasn't, there wasn't the uh, the mass movement that you saw oh, no. after 1947. No, it was all no. close knit. Thank you very much. That, that's that's all right. Yeah, but yeah. it it got slightly worse actually. Um, they began to feed in a, a, a sort of oh you're. That lot from, from Nottinghamshire, you, you, you make all the bloody profit and we don't make any at all and we, we're losing. So, so it, it, it spread a slightly different way, but it spread nevertheless. Mm. 
uh, and uh, they started recruiting people in South Wales from South Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire to improve South Wales, which got even worse reputation, you know, and they only bring them down here from to do this, that and the other, are you? Uh, so it, it, it had its stresses. Right. Okay. It, it was never quite stress-free in that sense. Right. So you were down there picking it up as it goes along? That's right. Uh, and you do, like you say, we're now 1940. Yes. And you do mention, oh, 1941, about the US Army having their guns degreased. That's right. Um, see, I was an electrical and mechanical and, and on their staff at that stage. Uh, the managing director sent me on special jobs. Oh, right. If he called somebody else, He'd say, John, uh, the American Army want their guns degreasing. You go and do it. Because I had to cut across all the staff membership, uh, of engineers, yes, workshops, yes, surface yes, and yes, underground, yes. To, to get it done. So I did it. It was only for a short spell. It took so me was like that. Yeah, so was that Chatley or did you go out towards Biddle? No, that uh, was that Chatley. So they brought him to Chatley? Yeah, we got an American who'd been to HA Crofts and said, Can you do this? And he said, I'll get somebody to do it. And John, uh, I said, Well, have you got a, a breech block that we can drill a hole through and connect with and do something else with it? He said, Yes. So, they brought one over and we did it in the fitting shop, drilled it through, so that when they brought the gun, we took the, their breech block off and put ours on and screwed in uh, hot steam from the boilers under pressure. Oh right, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And put a, a, a coil of hot steam round the barrel. Right. Uh, because grease was uh, a very rare commodity at that, that stage, and A.C. Crofts has said, save us the bloody grease if, if no doubts. You see, so we, we lowered the barrel down and we put uh, a, a barrel for the grease underneath. And once we got the system working, it only took about 20 minutes. So how many guns are you talking about? I think we did 200. 200 guns? Yeah. Uh, because they were stationed in Biddle, weren't they, the Americans? No. Yes, but, yeah. but they were t this, this was just the other side of Leek, between Leek and Buxton, where the American guns were. Blackshaw Moor? Yeah. The old Blackshaw Moor camp? That's right. So I, I didn't degrease their guns. All right. Right. It didn't take long once we got going. Uh, in fact, I would, once we got the system right, I was shunted. John, can you do something else? Oh, yeah. And, uh, and, that, and is that when you come across uh, Rudyard Lake being camouflaged? That's right. So how would how would you, as a 17-year-old, get from Chatterley to oh. Blackshire? Or we, did they transport you, or did you drive? No, 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 I didn't go. They came to me. Right. They brought the guns Yeah. through Biddulph. Because uh, they couldn't come up through Ball Green. No. Uh, then what? What? What had, what had they done to Rudyard? Just camouflage it all. Oh, we camouflaged it. Yeah, we, we took a, a team of men over uh, with a, a few rowing boats and barrels, empty barrels. Right. And we floated the barrels onto Rudyard Lake, and we got some old haulage rope, you know, the old tubs with yes, the, yes, the, the, the yes, scrap stuff. And just welded them onto the barrels, pulled them out onto the lake, uh, a lot of them, and then took ve vegetation and chucked it on top of the barrels and the ropes and camouflaged the lake. Right. I can't. Thinking back, that would have been a, a, a focal point, wouldn't it, for German bombers coming into oh, yes, Manchester? Was. They, they'd it look was at the fine rugged lake and then the cloud. That's right. And then the next stop would be Manchester. And Rudyard Lake is a mile long and absolutely north-south. So if they found yeah. that, that's right. the next point of call would be Manchester. That's right, or Sheffield or Coventry or whatever. So it was a good market. 
That's right. One farmer didn't think so. Because a few nights later, there was about a thousand bomber raid from Germany, raided a farm near Chester. <laughs> couldn't turn right or left. And ah, they so you missed, actually they missed it. it. So it worked. Oh, yes. It yes the RAF were quite pleased to tell us when we'd done it. Right. Any other uh, stories from the war? Uh, I know you mentioned one with buckets and uh, detonators. Ah, that was home guard. <laughs> that, that was home, home guard. That was de defensive. Yes. So who did you have your own home guard? That's right. Chatterley? Yeah, we had Chatterley Whitfield. Home uh, guard. Home guard. Yes. And, uh, I have for, for my sins. I got a medal for that. So what, what did you, were you actually in the home guard? Yes. So what was your rank? Did I you started off as a, a private. Yeah. And finished up as a sergeant. And the story of the buckets? Well, <clears throat> we were asked to defend us. Uh, I think it was a China exercise that they called it. We were going to be attacked by um, a Dutch regiment. Yeah, because they were based. They were based at Congleton. Were they? The Dutch, yeah. The Dutch regiment yeah. and uh, a Grenadier Guard group, uh, and they attacked us. And as a defensive mechanism, we laid corrugated tin sheets on all the paths with detonators underneath, not explosives as such, but detonators. Detonators just enough to kick them up, for which we got reprimanded. Because <laughs> you weren't supposed to. <laughs> they thought we were being a bit excessive in our defence, but uh, we stopped them coming. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Right, so we move on. I see what, what we've got now. You, you, you've done your coal face electrical stuff. You, That's right. It, do, it doesn't look like you spend much time down there if you're camouflaging Budget Lake.